Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. So we have a, a really great tech talk for you today. Um, I have my buddy here, Ryan Chinky from hey. Prisma. And uh, yeah, Ryan, do you want to do an intro? Sure. Uh, my name is Ryan. I work at Prisma and I am a developer advocate there. And today, I guess we're going to talk about Prisma. We're going to do some stuff with Prisma and some other other tech like Node. We're going to build a Node API. Um, and this is this is good to be back on the stream with you, man. I think it's been it's been over a year. I think I think it's like a year since last one we did. And I love doing these with you. It's always fun to go through and look at different technologies together. So I'm excited. I'm excited to be here. Me too. I think the last time we did a stream together, it was actually on Prisma as well. Right. Yep. Yep. So. This is actually, I was wondering about this because back then you didn't know too much about what Prisma 2 does and, and you weren't too familiar with it, but you, you've you been playing with it a lot uh, more recently. So what are, I guess, what are your opinions now? Now that it's been a year, now that you've you've been using it a little bit, what are, you, what are your thoughts? What's your latest yeah. thoughts? Uh, and before we get into that, I just want to throw it into chat. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, just say hey in chat so we know that uh, you're all here. And let everyone know where you're coming in from. We're from uh, Las Vegas for myself and Ryan. You are? I'm in Ottawa. I'm in Canada. Nice. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. But for Prisma, yeah, we were in V2. And recently, you all did a big announcement, right? Uh, yeah. Are you talking about the, um, the general availability, the complete ORM launch? Is that what you're referring to? Yes. The, is that V3 or... No, it's V2. So that announcement that you're thinking of, it's uh, we called it our complete ORM launch. And the reason that we called it that is because Prisma's got um, a few different products that that comprise that are comprised together to to make like for a, a, a complete ORM experience, if you will. So there's things like Prisma Client. That's how you talk to your database. There's Prisma Migrate, which is how you make changes to your database schema and uh, and evolve your database. And then there's Prisma Studio, which is like a, a GUI for looking at your data. And so in uh, recent months, these things all came to be um, uh, generally available. Um, all three of those things became generally available. And now we've got this complete ORM uh, that, that people can use and, and hopefully be successful with. So that was the announcement I think that you're referring to, which is that article there, um, the complete ORM launch. And so they, those are the three aspects that we'll actually touch on today, I think. We'll, we'll look at all three of these things. Right on. Perfect. Well, uh, just quick some shout outs to the chat. Coding Snowman, welcome. Uh, Ian from Michigan, welcome. Swarn from India. Uh, Carlos from Miami Beach. Oh, jo Joa? Joao from Brazil. Welcome, everybody. Glad to see you all here. So yeah, these are the three aspects. And uh, hey, Raman from Seattle. So the thing I, I want to talk, talk about is I saw that the big ORM complete launch happened. So I tried it out a little bit further and it's, it's come so far since I checked it out last year. Mm. Uh, and so much has matured. Like Prisma Studio is awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, the ability to see everything. I, I haven't really found a great database explorer that I like recently. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, well, that's good to hear. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, you're right. There's a lot that's been happening, a lot of development. We have like a, a very regular release cadence where we release a, a, a new minor version every two weeks. Sometimes that gets bumped by a week or whatever, but uh, depending on what's going on. But, you know, it's generally every two weeks we, we do a new minor release. So we're currently at version 2.24. So since version 2 came out, we've got uh, 24 minor releases. And uh, each one has generally, you know, new features, um, uh, improvements, things change a little bit to the API sometimes. You know, we always give a smooth path for uh, anything that is, you know, might be considered breaking. We always give a smooth transition path to, to using the new, you know, the new API, et cetera. But uh, like you said, it's come a long way. And I'm glad that you've uh, you've been digging in, digging in a bit more. Um, and yeah, I'm hoping we can kind of show off some of these features today through building a Node API. What do you think? I think so. And before we start this, uh, let's let's tell everyone what we're going to build today. Sounds good. So, are we settled on a chat API, like a, a chat between users, um, something that does that? What do you think? 
Um, chat or so we were thinking uh, maybe a it's either a chat API or a <laughs> jokes API. Your call. Uh, maybe if anyone in chat has a, a preference. Jokes, uh, Sabi, jokes would be easier. We see you over there. <laughs> uh, okay, jokes would be easier. Uh, but we still want to build relationships out in Prisma, right? Yep. We want to have something where we can model relationships. So like thinking about the jokes case, uh, we'd have like, you know, a database of jokes. So that would be a model of, uh, for itself would be like a, a jokes table. Then we would have, uh, we would need like to represent who, well, how would it work? Like a, there's a specific user that that tells a joke or, or um, provides uh, a joke into the database. Yeah. So we'll make a user and I guess they would be the joker technically. The joker, there you go. I like it. Yeah. Um, um, and then maybe we can have something. I, I want to get uh, a way to to model out many to many relationships. And usually, a good way to do this is to think about something that can you know have um, many on both sides, which would be like a category for for example for a joke. So um, you know, many jokes can have many different categories, etc. We we can we can maybe think about that. So I like this jokes. You know, this is simple. This is I think this scopes us pretty pretty well for for an hour session. So let's do yeah, jokes. Perfect. That's easier than than doing a chat thing. Okay, that sounds good. And the thing I like about this is we're we're doing this in a Node API and we're using PostgreSQL um, manage Postgres on date on DigitalOcean. Yep. Ooh, Rajesh has uh, uh, jokes, likes, and shares. That likes is a good idea too. There you um, go. Yeah. We can build that in. Cool. So this is getting into a little bit of a database management uh, architecture scenario. Mm -hmm. And we have a user who is going to be the creator of a bunch of jokes. So mm -hmm. that will be our one-to-many uh, relationship. So let's write this down a little bit further. A user has jokes, and that'll yep. be a one-to-many. And a joke belongs to multiple categories, right? Uh, yes. Or categories have multiple jokes. Right. You can, have, the... you can have uh, a category that um, has multiple jokes, but then a single joke can have multiple categories as well. So how is that modeled? Many Is that a many to many? Multiple jokes have multiple categories? Multiple jokes have multiple categories. Yeah, so that should be many to many, and that would mean there would need to be a pivot table in there, right? Right, and this is where we can take a look at some of Prisma's features for how to manage this through some kind of like virtual, maybe the same where you can do like, a, it's almost like a virtual pivot table. Mm -hmm. um, Sabin says, can we have tags on jokes? Sure, we can change categories to be tags. Let's do that, that's a better name for it. Yeah, okay. So, uh, and we see you all in chat. Thank you, everybody. I guess we'll do like shout outs every once in a while. Hey, CJ from Singapore. Uh, CJ is actually my nickname as well. Uh, Krishna from India. Pavel from Poland. Ricardo, welcome back. Uh, Krishna from India. Welcome, everybody. All right, so we have gotten to the kind of design, overall design of our database, which is, I think, incredibly hard stuff. So it's good we are, have gotten through here. So let's start out our Node API, right? Let's do it. Yeah. So let's do a TypeScript Node API. I okay. Think that's so a let good me place to start. Uh, Oaks API. Let's call this. I'm going to open this up in code. I'm using the Code Insiders version. What is Code Insiders? I don't know what this is. It's like the Insiders. Um, it's like kind of like a the unstable beta track. Oh, it's like a canary. For VS Code. Kind of uh, release exactly yeah Easy. yeah yeah um cool so we mm -hmm. need a new file and lead the way awesome uh well before you do a new file maybe we can just uh do an npm init here uh so open up the terminal if you could okay, let me hide some stuff let's open up terminal hide this out <clears throat> perfect okay then, so yeah why don't we get npm so uh, npm init dash y That'll give us a clean package JSON. Cool. So uh, let's get our let's start with dev. Uh, let's start with regular dependencies. So we need Express. Um, okay. Well, so you can even go into the terminal to install these uh, Express. 
we will also want Prisma client. So Prisma client, the way you get it is npm install at Prisma. So it's under the at Prisma namespace. And slash clients is where you get that. Good, good, good. Okay. So let's get that. Um, I think that's probably it for now for, for regular dependencies. The rest will be dev okay. dependencies. OK. So go ahead um, and enter there. Eric, we've got jokes. Don't worry. <laughs> Chris tells me, he assures me they are good. All right, um, we got those in there. Yes, we have our dependencies for Prisma client and Express. So. Sweet. Just for my understanding, Express is the uh, Node. They call it a framework. You can think of it as a framework, I suppose. Hey, for Node, it's uh, you know a way to uh, create uh, a, an API in Node or a website or whatever. It's it's a way to to work with HTTP in Node. Uh, essentially, you can create endpoints that serve either JSON back or text HTML, whatever you whatever Perfect. you might want. And then Anto has a good question in chat. Um, what is Prisma? So let's start here with what is Prisma client. And then I want to break out and say, uh, what is Prisma, which we already mm -hmm. talked about. It's an ORM, right? Object right. Relational Mapper. Um, but I think that's the right acronym. And the other question I want is, where is Prisma best used? Okay. So Prisma client. Right. Prisma client. Um, so looking back at that, uh, the page you had up with the three, three aspects of Prisma that make for the complete ORM launch, Prisma client is one of those. And it's um, what it is essentially is like a, a way for you to interact with your database as a developer. It is an, it is a, uh, a type safe way for you to interact with your database. So what's going to happen, and we'll see this as we go, that once we start creating our database schema, we will be able to generate this uh, the code for this Prisma client automatically. That's kind of the value that Prisma provides, is you give Prisma a schema, the shape of your database, um, and Prisma will give you a type safe, uh, completely type safe client, uh, which is essentially a way to access your database. Um, and and what's great about it is you get because of the type safety that you get from it, you it, it becomes very difficult to do something incorrect uh, within your database. So whereas you could write raw SQL that you know you got to be sure is correct uh, before you execute, Prisma gives you this layer of type safety that is beneficial because it becomes difficult to do an incorrect query. Um, your the type system will catch your mistakes before before you make them. And we'll we'll get a good look at that as we get building here. Perfect. Uh, yeah, I'm actually really excited to show that off because the amount of times Prisma's caught me making mistakes, uh, connecting and creating, reading and updating my database. Right. Very impressive. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, <laughs> so where's Prisma best used? Um, I think really quickly what I found is it is fantastic in node environments mm -hmm. and especially fantastic in serverless API environments, especially like Next.js routes, which uh, I've been doing a lot of lately. Yep. So you, you don't really need sure. the node API, right? You just need somewhere where you can run mm -hmm. node code. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So any kind of like uh, node execution environment is, you know, essentially anywhere that you can install um, a node module there you can use Prisma. Now you wouldn't want to do this on the client side. This is something for you know because you need to make a connection to your database. You need to um, you need to protect protect that access. You don't want to expose your database access keys and stuff like that. Um, so it, it it is for the server side, um, like you know any other uh, interaction with your database. Any you know any other interaction with your database is going to be from the server side. So you know same goes with Prisma, um, but. You can use it in Node, kind of with TypeScript or JavaScript. We also we also have a Go client. Um, so one interesting thing about Prisma is that the the engine that uh, produces all of the type safe um, stuff that you get, all of the goodies that you get from Prisma, it it goes through uh, Rust. Um, the the engine, the Prisma engine, is built with Rust. And what's interesting about that is that you we can provide different clients on top of this Rust engine. And so we have a client for Go. So you get 
you know, the same kind of experience that you would. I don't think it's at feature parity necessarily, but you get the same kind of experience in Go that you would with uh, with Node. And there's room for other clients in the future, maybe Python, right? Maybe Java, maybe C Sharp, things like this. Very, um, very cool. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, that is a good 15 minutes on, I guess, a little bit of theory. Let's actually go get a database and let's start building out this API for the rest of uh, the 45 minutes we have together. Let's do it. So, so to start us off, I am going to go to DigitalOcean. We have a managed databases project uh, product, which means that you don't have to really worry about the management of your database. We'll handle all of the um, upgrades, security, all that good stuff, um, and make it easy to scale. So here I'm going to open up a Postgres database. Basic node, $15 a month is solid. And there's a question for um, connection pools. We also offer connection pools, which makes it really nice to um, optimize your Postgres installation. So I'm going to say with the $15 a month, go ahead and pick a data center that's closest to us, right? Um, I think New York is a good go between between you and I. Sure. Prisma Fun, we'll call this database. And uh, let's go down. We'll create the database. And I wanted to do that so it had some time to spin up and create. So Prisma Fun was created. Here we go. Here we go. And here we get this nice installation thing that says, look, your database uh, is provisioning. Once that's good, we'll actually just get the connection string and we'll be able to copy that and start using it in our Node API. Uh, and connection pools is here. If you need that, you can just click that and add a connection pool, which makes it uh, a little bit more performant. Definitely recommend connection pooling, especially if you're in serverless, if you're, you're working with serverless, because you will exhaust your connection limits very quickly um, uh, when you're, you're running a serverless app. Um, and, and there's a, there's a little trick that you have to include in your connection string that we can take a look at uh, for the P, PG bouncer um, uh, property. So we can take a look at that later, though. That's a bit of a detail. Interesting. I don't know that trick. Yeah, I can get you uh, a link that talks about it as well. OK, so we have our um, package.json here. We have our node modules installed. Mm -hmm. uh, what's next? Uh, let's get the dev dependencies. There are a few of them, especially if we're going to work with TypeScript. Uh, do you have TypeScript in, uh, installed globally? I don't think so. Uh, okay, we can do npm install uh, dash d for development. Uh, we can do TypeScript. We can do at types slash node to get the types for node. We can do at types slash express. We can do Prisma. Uh, Prisma, th this here, this namespace, this is like the Prisma CLI. So this will give us commands to run. Um, and then why don't we do ts uh, dash node dash dev. This will be our the way that we execute, um, the, the way that we run our node uh, server so that it restarts. This is like Nodemon, right? It restarts every time we mm, make a change. Very nice. Uh, I cool. think that's it. We can try that. Cool. Yeah, so the cool thing about this, if you haven't worked with TypeScript before, um, and this type safety thing that Ryan keeps talking about, is you'll see it pretty soon but it can help us auto-generate our code and kind of hint at what we need to write before we're going to write it. Um, that's thanks to VS Code. It hooks into like the IntelliSense engine, right? Um, uh, yes. Yep. Yeah, we get IntelliSense. We get lots of goodies uh, from Prisma for typings, type safety. So it works out well. Um, okay. We need to initialize TypeScript. So uh, can you do? You just make sure that you can get TypeScript. Can you do which TypeScript? OK, so try npx typescript dash dash init. And let's make sure that gives you a uh, tsconfig. It should give you a tsconfig file. We Good. have one. Okay. Um, and then why don't we see if we can get like a, a minimal server running. So in the terminal, let's make a new file. You can touch a server.js, or even just put it in here, server.ts, rather. Um, That's right, TypeScript. Yeah. TypeScript. Um, and then just make like a, a function, maybe a function called main that just console.logs something. 
don't have my snippets today. Okay. Um, hey, Hello. everyone in chat. Hi, Arpan. <laughs> cool. Arpan's here. Ar Arpan's always around. You can always count on Arpan. Uh, let's, let's, call, Arpan. let's call main. Let's uh, execute it here. Sweet. And then in the terminal, let's try to run it. And for that, you can do ts node dev against server ts. Server.ts. And David Marr, if you're in chat still, mm -hmm. maybe you saw I did that uh, command K trick to clear the console. Good stuff. Did you get TS no dev in your package JSON? Let's take a uh, look. Let's see. Package JSON. Dev dependencies, TS no dev. Right. You want to should we do a script for like Yeah, try uh, do, doing dev. dev script and then TS no dev against server.ts. Okay. Let's try running that. Let's see if that works. Um I don't have any of my uh, extensions today. That's okay. NPM run dev. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay, sweet. Cool. So we've got our server. Um, why don't we try to get uh, an express server now? Um, something that will be able to respond to requests, HTTP requests. Um, and in server TS, uh, why don't you import a couple things? You can import express. Cool. Uh, and then maybe just do like a const app equals express. And then once you do app dot get, so we can make an endpoint here. A solid endpoint. Cool. Is it rec res still? Rec res. There are typings for the um, for the request and response, and they come from the express import. What is it like? Uh, I think it's just requests. Is that it? Uh, I think it's request that comes from Express, maybe. I, I can't remember. Request and response. Do those import from Express? Like if you tried to. Uh, yeah, this one right here. And there you go. Let's just do it right there. Uh, benefits of TypeScript, huh? Yep. Uh, and then just do like response JSON with an object or something like that. Uh, let's do. Let's call out uh, Marcos. Hi, Marcos and Backyard Possum. I can delete all that now. Yeah. Uh, yep, you can delete all that. You just need to call app.listen at the end. It's been a while since I've done a full on Express server. <laughs> I feel like I've done so many demos that it's just all like. Second nature now, but yeah, it's been a while for me too. Uh, App listen, put give it a port, maybe like three thousand one or something, whatever you like. Uh, cool. And can you save that and then try to just make sure it runs? Let's uh, run dev. Looks like it's running. We can test it if you get Postman going or some REST clients. You can try to send a request to three thousand one. Let me open Postman real quick. And uh, if you're not familiar, Postman is a way to uh, is a tool that lets us send HTTP requests to certain endpoints, like this uh, URL that we have here. So let me just double check. There's a. I was just watching um, James Q Quick on YouTube. He was talking about a uh, an extension for VS Code clients. Thunder yes. client, yeah, that looked interesting. I might give that a shot. Um, cool. So here is Postman, <coughs> and let me actually just hide everything. So here is the request that we are going to create, and we enter in our URL, which should be at HTTP localhost three thousand one, right? Uh, yes, that's three thousand one. So oh, if we hit this endpoint, we should get that JSON object with the message "Hi." Backyard Possum and Marcos. And there we go, right down there. Great. Well, good. Um, OK, so I guess we're ready now for everything else, for Prisma, because we got the Express side all wired up. Um, 
yeah, let's wire up Prisma. So this is where it starts to get interesting with Prisma. And the, you know, it's it's super easy to actually like initialize it and get started get started with it. Um, why don't you open up the terminal and I'll show you kind of the steps that you'd go through here. Um, okay. Chris installed, for those watching, Chris installed pr the Prisma CLI uh, by doing npm install dev Prisma. So the Prisma CLI, which gives you the commands that you want to like initialize Prisma and run migrations and um, and generate the Prisma client, et cetera, they come from this package Prisma. So this is the Prisma CLI. Um, so you can either install it globally on your machine or you can install it like on a per uh, project basis. We recommend that you install it per project because you will probably end up with some case where you've got different Prisma versions between different projects. And if you have a global Prisma that you're running CLI commands against, then it can ha cause like version clashes and stuff like that. So scoping it to a project, always a good way to go. And, uh, and what you can do, Chris, is uh, you can run NPX Prisma and NIT. Let's do that. And the reason we do NPX here is because NPX will first look into your uh, dependencies in your package JSON, and if it finds that package there, it'll use it. But if it's not there, it'll go to the network and and get it from npm directly um, in real time. So it looks like you're good. You've got Prisma initialized, and why don't you show your table of contents in your editor to show the Prisma directory that got created? So there is Prisma, and in the Prisma directory comes this schema.prisma file. And uh, schema.prisma is where your the shape of your database lives. It's where you describe all of the tables in your database, and you uh, give them their it, the shape, like the you, you put the fields that you want in each table, you describe your tables, you, uh, you put relationships between tables, you, you, you say how your tables are related, and all of that. And so we'll see how all of that works. So, um, so you're saying this is the start of a Prisma setup, yep. and we're going to define our entire database in this one file. You got it, yeah. Um, there is a, a request from many people to be able to support multiple schema files. Uh, it's not currently supported. There's a workaround where you can you can effectively get that, but it's it's uh, it's underway. Work on, on that uh, improvement is underway, so it, it'll be coming. But right now, you operate just in this, this uh, single file. Cool. So, um, yeah. Database URL is next, yeah? Yeah, that's, so that's pointing to an environment uh, variable called database URL, which should be in, uh, you should get a .env file that got created uh, in your in the root of your project. Oh, it already, it already creates the env as well. That's yes. nice. There you go. So it gives you a, um, a default database URL, which points to like a local server. So you can mm -hmm. swap that out for your, your DO um, server, if you like. Cool. OK, so we have this here. I am going to move everything so we can hide some passwords for a second because this right here will be a password. Yep. Uh, let me go push that over there. So when you spin up a managed database on DigitalOcean, this is how quickly we can grab a uh, connection string to this database called Prisma Fun. You go get started. Uh, you can secure the database, which for this demo, we're just going to leave everything open. So I'll say do that later. Uh, connection details right here. I can actually get all of the username, password, host, all that good stuff right here. Or I can just say, uh, let me zoom in. I can just say in this dropdown, connection string. And now I have this whole thing that actually has the password there. And I'm going to move that out so we don't share that. And um, perfect. So on the demo, on your ENV, it has schema public. We don't need that? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure what schema equals public actually does. Uh, I always take it out uh, when I'm working with uh, databases. So I guess you don't need it. I, I really don't okay. know what it does, though, to be honest. Then we're good, then. <laughs> OK. Um, a note on the provider, it's Postgres in this case, because we've got a Postgres database. But the other ones that we support currently are MySQL, SQLite, uh, MS SQL, and that's all, I think. Um, I need to double check, actually. But in any case, it's it's relational databases that we support right now. There is preview support for MongoDB. Uh, that is the first document database that we are, are uh, testing out support for. It is very early. Um, give it a shot if you like, but it's uh, you know it's, it's early access for for MongoDB. Um, 
Yes. <laughs> okay. So why don't we hop down into modeling? Um, so on line 13, Chris, why don't you create a model? Uh, for those wondering, uh, this this file is called it's schema.prisma. So it's a it's a you know a special file type, right? We call it the Prisma schema language. Uh, so a dot Prisma file will give you Prisma schema language, and there's various things you can do. It's very if you have the VS Code extension for Prisma installed, it's very um, intuitive. You get auto completion, um, auto generation, like for relations. We'll see that in a second. Um, so it's quite it's quite nice. Um, yeah. So what so, do we model first? What do you think? So this is really exciting for me. Just a side note because uh, one of the classes in uh, college that I got the most value out of was modeling databases. Okay. Uh, and we did that class by writing databases on a piece of paper and like drawing <laughs> relationships and stuff. So this nice. is kind of uh, really fun for me, a new age sort of database modeling, like yeah. straight up in code um, as close to the code as possible, right? Yep. Yep. It's it's nice. And it's very succinct too. I think you'll you'll find that. It's like really easy to, to write and to give types for your fields and stuff like that. Um, cool. Why don't we start with, let's start with jokes. Let's give a model for jokes. OK, so here we are jokes. Uh, I'll put user below it. So a joke will exist. A user will be the person that like submitted or wrote the joke. Um, and then tags are on jokes. Yeah? Yep. Cool. You got it. Uh, OK, so we start with model, the keyword model. And then we will do an uppercase. This is kind of convention. You're not forced into this, but we uh, we do uppercase. And we always do singular uh, by convention. So you'll give a model and then the table name. Joke becomes your, your table name. And then you open up your curly brackets. Um, yeah, and that's how you, you open the structure for your table. Uh, then what you've got to do is you've got to describe the fields in your table. Um, so kind of, so, you know, minimum of so one this, field. This is interesting because Prisma already told me I messed up. <laughs> So it's well, already it, really good at at like validating everything right. as you type, right? Yep, validation is great. Uh, you haven't messed up. It's just that you ha need to give some content to your table. Right, um, right, right, right. But yes, you, you're absolutely right. Like the the red squigglies will will show up uh, to to guide you, and it's uh, it's quite intuitive that way. Um, cool. So I always start with an ID. So a field called ID. And I, what I like to do is make it a string and use a collision-resistant unique ID. You're not forced into that. You can do um, a, an integer, right? And you can auto-increment it, or you can do uh, um, a universal unique ID. So there's type string. You can do type int, uh, depending on what you're, you're wanting to do. And then we've got these decorators. These, you know, you'll do the at symbol, and then there's a number of, of decorators that we've got here. And so the one that you'll want to pick for this is ID, to say that this is the primary key for this table. Um, so we, we decorate it with that. And then we also want to give it a default value. So if you call at default next. You can say, this is my default value that I want. And we've got a couple different functions that you can use. If you start typing out cu id in there, Chris, cu id, that's a collision resistant unique ID. So it'll just spit out like a, a random string for you. Um, there's also uu id for that like really long uh, universal unique ID, um, mm. you know, different flavors of that. I, I tend to go with this for my, my tables. So there's that, and you know there's other decorators as well uh, that we'll maybe we'll get into some of them, but uh, lots of lots of tools here. Uh, yeah. Okay, so let's think about what the joke table looks like. I guess for a joke, it's probably just a couple of fields really. It's the joke text, I suppose, like the actual joke itself. Yep. I don't know what you want to call that field. We you know it could be various things. We could call it. Yeah, a joke. I don't I don't want to. Call it joke because then you would like in your JavaScript you'd be calling jokes. Joke dot joke. Joke dot joke. Yeah, which yeah, is always annoying. Weird. Um, <laughs> yeah, text, text is fine. sounds good to me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is a type string. That's it for that one. Um, which what we can show Chris really quick though, if you go next to string and you call at db, and then you do a dot. <clears throat> We've got these uh, these specific database types that you can also use. There, there's like varchar, right? If you're working with Postgres or or most um, most relational databases, will have a varchar type. Um, if you give your your field a type of string, it's going to default it to a certain default type depending on which database you're working with. And we've got a whole like 
uh, doc that that shows this. But it, it, in Postgres, I think it defaults it to like text is the field type, something like that. Mm. Um, but you can override it. You can say, give me a, a specific field type uh, for for this field. And uh, right, so you can call varcar and then a number of uh, well, number of spaces you want. So for this, would you think text is maybe too much, and you would recommend going varcar? I, I um, love saying varchar. I don't know. I'm I'm not sure. Like personally, when you would want to use text over varchar varcar. Um, do you know? Like, what's what's the difference in Postgres that you? Would I just use? remember. Well. I, in in MySQL, I just remember text having much larger requirements, um, and Varchar got the job done for most things of this size. Right. Um, but, right. Um, well, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, you can certainly use Varchar if you like, but uh, String works too, just for like quick and dirty for this. Oh, and I just saw something. This sounds cool too. Is it possible to do an array here? Yes. Yep. You can do arrays. Um, so with Postgres, we've got. JSON, you can have JSON types for your fields and JSON arrays, I guess. And then I guess you could do a string array like that too. I haven't done that myself, but I suppose you could have an array of strings in a field. We could test that out later. Um, yeah. I, the other, I think the other uh, option you saw there with, with the question mark, that means it's an optional field as you might. might uh, gotcha. Think. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it looks like we're coming up at 836. Uh, and I definitely want to get us to the CRUD stages. Or all right, let's, let's get moving. Inserting, yep, migrating, all that good stuff. Okay, so let's quickly, we'll jump down to user. Let's model out user. Um, uh, okay. And then we'll, we'll relate them after after we create the user. Uh, so same kind of ID uh, for this one, I think, ID string. So that auto uh, completing, all, the, all that IntelliSense is really, really helpful. Yeah, it's, it's great. It saves a lot of time. Uh, um, let's give a user real quick. maybe... A first name and a last quick. name, do you think? Oh, Ryan, yeah, um, as Carlo has a great point, are these not nullable? I think you can make them nullable, right? Nullable would be... Uh, so by default, they are not nullable. But if you want to make them nullable, yeah, you do the, the question mark. Okay, so that would make it optional, and then it would default to nullable if not existing. Yes, I, I believe that's the way it works. I'd have to double check, cool. but it's, it's something like that. Um, cool. Yeah. So, what what else? First name, last name, I guess. Uh, let's just keep name. Name sounds good. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, so now we can relate user to joke, and this is where we'll see a lot of the autocomplete for Prisma. So, let's think about this. A joke is going to have a single user, and correct. a user is going to have many jokes. So, correct. what I do in this situation is I'll come down onto line. Uh, I'll bump down a new line after twenty five. And I'll say, this user should have a field called jokes, plural. And then I say the type is going to be joke, referring to the model up there, and it's going to be a joke array. And so you get a red squiggly because it's not quite done yet. But if you hit save, if you save this, you'll get some autocomplete. Is it saved? Yeah. I think you need to do a little bit more, like actually say relation. Uh, you do, but it should be auto. It should auto complete for you. Mm. You did save it, hey, and you've got the Prisma. Yeah, interesting. Try doing uh, so in joke. Then let's let's delete that. Delete what you have on line twenty six, and go to line twenty, and then do uh, user, and then point to the user model. So, and correct me if I'm wrong. I think you all recommend from the Prisma docs. You recommend. Um, Instead of user, you recommend uh, like owner or creator or something like that. like something with more context than just um, user. That might be, yeah, that might be. It, it, I guess it's very contextual for your application. But um, I what I typically do is like I'll just refer the, the from the field itself. name to like the model name. But yeah, like creator creator works too. And you, you're not forced into any particular name for your fields, right? You can just point to user. Yeah. Um, Okay, try saving this. If not, maybe we need to run the formatter or something like that. Okay. So yeah, so it's not auto completing. Uh, try that, I guess. Not working. I don't think that was that. Do what Prisma needs it. Oh, there you go. It does. That's Sweet. Cool. Okay. So oh, let's look at what we've maybe, got. Maybe maybe you have auto format on save. Auto format on save should be there. Yeah. Were you saving the file? Okay. 
I was, but I don't have it in. I don't have it auto format on save. I see. Okay, so, so that that yeah. would have been it. Yeah. Cool. Um, Thanks, so MJ. Real, real quick, what we're seeing here is creator, that field name on line 20 is pointing to the user type, uh, user model, which is below. And we're then describing a relation between these two tables. This field called creator is like this kind of virtual Prisma field that will be exposed through the Prisma client. It doesn't actually exist in the database, but what does exist is the user ID field on line 21, which is the ID for that user model. And that's how these two things get, uh, get tied together. Um, so... So this field points to a field on the model that it lives in, and then it references a, uh, a field on an external model. Yes. So fields and that array user ID, that points to the field name on line 21. And it says that right. references in the model that we're relating to, which is user, refer references the ID field in that user model. Gotcha. OK. Yep. <clears throat> and then um, line 28, what you see there is that a user has many jokes. And what I like to do, because autocomplete will always um, will always give you exactly what's in the model name. So I like to do a lowercase j just to keep things consistent. And bring in and the S. Yeah. yeah, plural. That's what I do. Um, sweet. OK, let's save this. And you know what? I think we're probably not going to have time for this this many to many relation. That we'll just have time for for user and joke, but that's fine. Why don't we get some data going? So, um, Chris, if you want to, um, uh, if you want to migrate this, we can we can start getting some data in there. Sure. Let me, let me uh, touch on a point real quick that I think yep. my, maybe some people have is if I'm using like mongoose or something with like MongoDB, I don't really need to model my information, right? Like I just create a JSON object and just throw it into the database. Mm -hmm. So what's the big benefit of modeling out your databases of uh, explicitly creating your relationships and having to do this setup? Uh, like it, it, if if you were using Prisma on top of Mongo specifically or? Well, if if you had the option to not do any of this modeling? Like if you had the option to go full on no SQL and say, mm -hmm. uh, I don't need models. Okay, right, I see what you're saying. So, um, I mean, the, modeling your, your data like this and giving it a schema is going to give you guardrails essentially for how your, your data is shaped in your database and then how it's consumed later on. And so one of the detriments, I mean, one of the, the strong points of something like Mongo where it's totally schemaless and you can throw whatever in there is that you don't have to make changes to your schema as your database evolves. You can just start you know, putting new fields in at will. But that means that the burden of uh, enforcing the schema for your application, for your organization, let's say, uh, falls to your application itself and you start having to do checks in your code. Like if this field exists, then take this branch. If uh, this field does not exist, do this. But if you delegate that instead to your database, which is by default what you do in a relational database, then you have uh, protection sort of upstream from your application. So that's how I like to think about it. Yeah, good, uh, good chat going on right now. It's like TS versus JS. So guardrails, like you're saying, Eric mm -hmm. says schemas with Mongo is nicer. Um, Aditya says, can we use Prisma with MongoDB? Not just yet, right? Ryan? There's a, there's early access. There's like a preview version of it, but it's uh, it's not feature complete yet. Uh, but follow okay. along with the uh, the development. It, it is, you know, on the way. Cool. All right. So let's uh, migrate and let's start working with data. Let's do it. So you can do NPX Prisma migrate dev. Let's try that. And this will basically look at the schema Prisma file. Yep. And and what does it do? It will look at your schema file, and then it will um, generate. It'll it'll put the sh that shape into your database. It'll create tables for you, etc. And what you can see, Chris, if you go to the to your table of contents. Uh, well, yeah. First, let's step through this. So we'll enter a name, which will be init. Now what you see is you've got a migrations file that gets created for you. And then after that, yeah. it says generated the Prisma client. And we'll see that once we start working uh, against our, our API. Um, so in the sidebar though, yeah, you get this migrations folder. And in there, in that first migration is the SQL that was used to generate 
uh, the tables that you've described in your model. And so every time you need to change your data model, you will work in your schema.prisma file, you'll make adjustments, and then you'll run a migration. It will put a new folder in place in the migrations um, directory, and then you can run that migration to change the shape of your database. And this is you know, essentially what you use to evolve your database over time. And it's uh, it's great because now you can sort of play all of these steps back and you can get your database into a consistent state between like developments and staging and, and production. Solid. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I uh, this is very, like this migrations list and I'm sure folders get added. Uh, I come from the Laravel sort of world. So this is very cool to see right. in the familiar for you. node side. Yeah. Um, cool. So yeah. we have like 15 minutes left. I definitely want to leave some time for questions. So let's start moving. Let's rock it through it. All right. So in the terminal, Chris, if you could run NPX Prisma uh, Prisma Studio. Cool. So let's do. Let me clear that out. Thank you for Command K. <laughs> uh, NPX Prisma Studio. So this is one of the big three things that you were just talking about, right? That is, yep. So Prisma Studio gives you a GUI, a nice uh, way to view your database. And so you might ask, like, what's different? The difference between this and like things like Table Plus and whatever else I might be using. One of the the great things I like about this is working with relations. So for example, let's click into user and let's create a new user. You can just create yourself. You can add a record. Um, uh, give yourself a name. Let's go for uh, Aditya. I see you in chat. Cool. Let's save that change. And now if we open up the jokes table to add a joke, what we can do um, is, so what you want to do, Chris, actually, is you want to go up to the top. There's a plus sign beside the user tab. And you can open up the joke table. And cool. you can create a new one. So you can add a record. And why don't you copy paste right. some of those great jokes you've got? No, no, no. Don't, don't tell them we're copying and pasting, Ryan. Well, I mean, copy and pasting from your fingertips is what I mean. Uh, can't type. Real programmers count from zero. I mean, classic joke, right? <laughs> I love that joke. Um, okay, so creator, I can actually create a reference here. Yeah, this is what I love about Prisma Studio is like you get the uh, relations uh, displayed to you just uh, up front when you're creating data or if you're looking through data, you can uh, just immediately associate your joke with a user and you're done. Okay. Um, and so, so yeah, I don't you... need to fill in user ID now. Exactly. I just clicked this. I... Do I click out? Do I click out, save change? Oh, and the user ID already got populated. Really yep. nice. Cool. Sweet. Okay. So we've got like 13 minutes. Let's show the Prisma client uh, in um, the Express app. So we can hop over to Express and we can actually pull this data out now using Prisma client. So I'm going to so, leave Studio up real quick. I'm going to go to a new one, and let's do npm run dev. Cool. And that should refresh for us. Uh, so right up at the top, after we import Express, let's do a new import. Sorry, everybody. I just... <laughs> OK, <laughs> new import. Uh, import uh, Prisma client from... Is it destructured? Destructured, yeah from at Prisma slash clients. And then we can do a const uh, Prisma equals a new Prisma client. That's how we instantiate it. Um, <clears throat> you can provide options there, but I just leave it blank for now. Um, then That's right, because, okay, never mind. Yeah, you, you, there are options you can put in, like ways you can log info, for example, but we don't really need that for now. Um, I'm just saying, because it already knows the database URL from this up here. Yes, yep. When, when you okay. generate your Prisma client, as as uh, you do when you migrate, when you run a migration, it generates the code for the client for you. It will, it'll wire up that URL. Uh, get all jokes. That's a good endpoint to have. Create a joke. Classic CRUD app, yeah? Yep. Uh, delete a single joke. So real quick... Let's um let's go through and app dot post this would be, um and I'll actually just copy everything from here. Set here. Um, this would be app dot get, and this would probably be like what joke ID? Joke ID, yep. Yeah. This would be app dot delete. Joke ID again. You got uh, it. And. Cool. So we have the basis of a CRUD 
API here, uh, of a node API. And you can do all this in a serverless functions. Uh, let's say you're using Next.js API routes. Yep, exactly. Yeah, it, it translates one for one, essentially. Um, okay, so line eight, why don't you put async in front of your anonymous function there, just so we can use await. We'll use async await. And then let's uh, say const jokes equals await prisma. And this is where it gets really cool. This is where it clicks for a lot of people. When you call prisma and you do dot, you've got methods, but you also got properties that point to what's in your database. So for example, joke and user. Those are tables in your database. And now you can pull them out. Um, and it's all type hinted. It's all um, you know type safe and everything like that. So you, you get it auto filled for you. And now you've got methods like uh, creating one or getting finding all, things like this. Um, everything you would need for working with your database. So we can call joke.findmini, uh, and then you would uh, execute it. So you just give it the your braces. And that's about it. Now you can do uh, response.json jokes to send them back. Easy enough, huh? So we have the one joke. Uh, sorry, everyone. I really should have my auto formatter on. OK, so. If we just go to Postman again and hit this endpoint, we should get all of our jokes. So yep. let's go here, 3001, um, send. Uh, let's see. Oh, did I not save Check it? your terminal. It might not have re. Let's try it again, either way. OK, so there is that. Let's click Send. There we go. So we have jokes coming from our database. Yep. And what we can do now uh, to show this off, since we have a relation, why don't we get the user for this joke uh, along with it when we go to find all? Um, so when we find many, we can put some brackets in there. And this is where you start to configure options. Like you can filter with a where clause, or you can uh, say you only want certain fields to come back, um, mm -hmm. or you can say include. And include, if you just start typing in there, Chris, what you see is it auto completes for you. Again, this is you know awesome about TypeScript, is it gives you what you um, you can do. So include, and then you put uh, you put some curly brackets, and you would say user. Uh, or do we call it user or creator? Well, actually, this is a good yeah, this is a good yeah. use case, right? We weren't sure, and this is the case like you're working with lots of developers. Not everybody has the head knowledge about what is in the schema unless they go look at it, right? But if you're using Prisma client, you can just give them something that auto-completes for them, which is super beneficial. Yeah, um, this, the, the, so I triggered IntelliSense with control spacebar. Yep. And immediately it said, hey, do you probably want creator? Yep. Amazing. Yep, that works very well. You can kind of look ahead to see what you can access uh, with that, um, using that function. So you can say creator true, and why don't you save that, and we can see it in the in Postman. I guess it's not. It, it seems like it's not uh, picking up the say the changes when you save them. But I didn't restart the server last time. I wonder what's going on. It might. I don't know. Something weird is happening. But uh, just right, try. Let's running. just restart it either way. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Connection refused. Let's keep going. There we go. There we go. Creator. Um, nice. Yeah. So you can you can easily get access to multiple levels of, of your your data structure like that. Um, what do we want to do? Want to try creating one? Well, we can give it some um, data. Yes. Yeah, so let's do a. Uh, this is probably the last one we'll do because we're short on time. But to create a joke will probably be const uh, joke is well, let's get async in here, right? Yep. is equal to await uh, prisma dot joke dot create. Create, there you go. Uh, and then is it data? Data, yep. You want to get, when you create something, you want to give it a data key, and then you'll be able to see what needs to be included. Um, so for example, let's say that we thought maybe the the name of the, the text should be, um, or maybe we thought the field for the actual joke content should be joke in this case, right? So you start typing out joke. Um, instead of text there, Chris, try putting joke, and we'll, we'll see what the uh, the editor gives us. Nothing. So 
yeah, if we thought it was joke that's supposed to go here, immediately what we'll see is we can't really even continue. It's going to give us this red squiggly. And what's the error message that you get there? The TypeScript uh, message. Um, joke is not assignable to type. Uh, well, I guess this is a better one. So essentially what it's saying is that this field isn't appropriate in this spot. Um, so you can look into what is supposed to go here. Again, if you do your little method of, of doing control spacebar instead of joke. Say that again? If you do uh, control spacebar. And what we get up at the top is text. Text should go here. Um, so why don't we fill that out? We can do text and then we can put in another joke. Yeah, that's sorry. That's why I was uh, a little distant. I'm like looking for a joke. Oh, no worries. Cool. Um, <laughs> I like that one. That's a good one. I haven't seen that before. <laughs> um, <laughs> cool. So let's see. I think we, we still have I red squiggly, and that's because we need to associate a user. Um, we don't have a user associated with this joke yet. So. Uh, there's a couple ways to do this if you want to associate a relation. But what you can do, Chris, I think you can come down on line 21 and put uh, user ID. Um, so bump down after line 20 and do user. Doesn't like user ID, eh? Yeah, Fair OK, it's user ID. Yep. And then you can go pull that user ID for your, your user out of Prisma Studio. This is just a quick mm -hmm. and dirty way to do it. Yep. You can just so pull user... that ID. Copy that, come back over, paste that in. You can put it in like that. And then why don't we just return this joke after we, it's been created? That's usually what we do. Um, and then the, the other thing here is if we wanted this joke to come from the actual uh, API request, right? Yeah. Or the HTTP call, you would do like const uh, text is equal to rec, what is it, dot body? Yeah, and we would need to install some middlewares to make this happen right now, which we're running a bit short on time to do. But essentially, yeah. you'd want to get like the JSON parser or body parser rather for Express. Um, the these things wouldn't be immediately available. You you need a, right. a middleware to make them happen. Right, but the, that's the way you would pass it in through uh, like Postman or a, a fetch in JavaScript. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So we have that, and then do we return the joke? Yeah, we can do return yeah, response JSON. You don't need the return. You don't need to actually call return. You can just do response you're right, JSON. You're right. <clears throat> cool. So let's go give that a try. Well, let's restart just in case. And let's go. Last thing we'll do. Um, I want a post request. That's all of the differences, right? Yep. It should just be a post request. Send it. Should have created a new one. Um, gave us the joke back. Yep. And if I go to Prisma Studio, should see joke. Let's refresh, and there it is. Sweet. So super easy. Nice. Yeah. So we got to like the end there, where we kind of saw the workflow where you can you can update your database, you can do CRUD operations mm -hmm. from a Node API, and then Studio helps you see it pretty much immediately, right? So there's like yeah. a whole circle of tools that you all have provide. Yep. Absolutely. So it's it's a nice like it, it rounds itself out very nicely. Really nice developer experience. Um, people seem to be having a lot of a lot of success with it. So if anyone's interested, check it out. And uh, why don't you show the website for Prisma there, Chris? Prisma.io is the URL. Um, yeah, head over there, give it a try. Super easy. Yeah, and uh, feel free to reach out if you got questions about it. Uh, one thing I want to point out, just really quick before we finish up, people often ask like, where are these types being generated to that you get for mm. the Prisma client? And if you go to your Node modules, you'll see them in the .prisma folder, uh, index.d.ts. Mm. This is where all of the types get generated to. So you can look for joke. You can do a control control F to look for joke. There, there it goes. Is. Yep. So every time you do a my well, there's two ways, right? You can migrate or you can generate, and yep. it'll generate this file. Cool. The uh, things end up here when you generate. Um, the generate command is called automatically when you migrate. So gotcha. but you, you don't need to migrate to generate a new client. You can do it you know, at any point. Um, solid. Well, 
Thank you for that, Ryan. I know that uh, we had a couple more things we wanted to do when we came up on time. So let us know in the comments if you would like to see us do kind of a bigger application now that we've gotten through this intro. Uh, I think that'd be a lot of fun. And uh, let's see, Ryan, where, where can we find you? Uh, I think right there is the best spot, Twitter. Check it out, Ryan Schenke on Twitter. Um, yeah, that's probably cool. best. Cool. Just a link there. Uh, and as always, you can find me at Chris underscore underscore Sev um, on the Twitter verse. But yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ryan, for joining. Thanks, everyone yeah. in chat for joining. Uh, any, any last words, Ryan? No, I think I'm good. Uh, thanks for having me. This has been fun. Um, let's do another one sometime. Right on. Will do. Thanks, everyone in chat uh, for joining another one. And we'll see you next time.